starring all cars, the presentation of the Rio Grande Oil Company. Boston, we please call you all cars, attention all cars, broadcast 53, an ambulance follow-up on Whitmer Street, a dead woman. That's all, rolling and close. notice the number of this broadcast? Number 53. That means calling all cars. Tonight starts its second year on the air. Proving to us that our public likes realistic, true-to-life drama. To get correct information about the crimes broadcasted on these programs, it is necessary for William N. Robeson, author and producer of Calling All Cars, to interview police officials in dozens of cities in California and Arizona. In many of these cities, Rio Grande cracked gasoline is officially specified for police use. As he talks with drivers of police cars, they invariably praise Rio Grande cracked gasoline. They assure him that all these statements we make over the radio are true. Here's what they say. We really do get faster starting when we use Rio Grande cracked gasoline. We keep our radio patrol cars cruising slowly about the city. At any second, an emergency call sends us roaring down the road as fast as the car will go. And we find that Rio Grande cracked gasoline gives us greater speed than uncracked gasoline. In police work, we demand every bit of power the engine can produce. And tests have shown us that Rio Grande cracked gasoline develops more power. That's why we continue to use it year after year in all our emergency equipment. Perhaps some of you motorists feel that if Rio Grande is so speedy and powerful, it cannot be an economical gasoline. But police records prove that Rio Grande not only gives police cars more power and speed, but also gives greater mileage than uncracked gasoline. So there is no reason you shouldn't enjoy police car performance in your own car. It costs no more. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight we present a true police drama entitled Sometimes People Aren't Murdered. And we are pleased to present the officer who worked tirelessly in this case, Detective Lieutenant Joe Filkin. Sometimes policemen make mistakes while only trying to do their duty. We police officers realize that circumstantial evidence may often convict an innocent man. While our detectives find evidence of guilt, they work tirelessly to uncover other facts. We try just as sincerely to prove of innocence as proof of guilt. Sometimes in a sincere attempt to serve justice, policemen work hardships on individuals. Tonight, story tells of an investigation carried on by myself and my partner, which nearly sent an innocent man to the gallows. We were doing our duty, the accused innocent, but could not prove himself so. The key to the strange mix-up was sealed by death on the lips of a supposed victim. Here was a problem for great, for a great dramatist, a situation truly stranger than fiction, for it all happened and happened not long ago. Hello? Hello, is my sweetheart here? Well, if you don't know her name, then no one does. Hello, darling. I'm so glad you're home. Did you miss me? Miss you? You'll never know how much I miss you. Oh, I wish you didn't have to work every night until midnight. I get so lonely. Well, I know, darling, but it's a lot better than having no job at all. Yes, I suppose so. Are you hungry? Mm-hmm, a little bit. Well, then come in here and sit down. I've got coffee perking and sandwiches all made. Oh, what a wife you are. Do you think I'll do? No, well, I wouldn't trade you in for any other model. <laughs> you darling. Sit down. Mm. Mm. Coffee smells good. You know, sweetheart, you make the best coffee in the whole world. Now, Mr. Jackson, if you keep on like that, I'll think you're in love with me. And when you come to that conclusion, Mrs. Jackson, you'll be dead right. <laughs> Black or cream tonight? Cream. I don't want to get coffee nerves. Aren't you having any? No, I've got coffee nerves or some kind of nerves. Well, what's the matter? Aren't you feeling well, darling? Oh, just as usual. I've got a pain in my back, that's all. Oh, that's a shame. Look, why don't you see a doctor? 
Doctors don't do me any good. I've run out of those tablets I get from St. Louis. They're the only thing that really helps. Hey, what the heck are they? Oh, some kind of nerve medicine. I haven't had one for five days. Well, you've sent for some more, haven't you? Mm, yes, they'll be here any day now. They'll take away the pain. Well, I certainly hope so. I don't want my little girl to have any aches and pain. Oh, Tom, you're so sweet. I've never been so happy in my life. <laughs> I feel like crying sometimes. <laughs> you want some more coffee, dear? Yeah, a little bit. Mm, these sandwiches are swell. I got that nippy cheese especially for you. You think of just about everything, don't you? <laughs> Well, just now, I'm thinking of going to bed. All right, you run along. I'll be in just as soon as I finish this coffee. Despite his two cups of coffee, Mr. Jackson sleeps soundly for several hours. At about 7 a.m., half awake, he stretches his arm across to his wife's side of the bed. When he fails to touch her, he wakens. Marge? Marge, darling, where are you? Marge, what are you doing there on the floor? Marge, answer me. Darling, what's the matter? You're cold. Here, let me get you back in bed. There. There, this ought to warm you up. Darling, what is it? Marge! Marge, speak to me! Oh, no! No, 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 no! Realizing his wife is dead, Mr. Jackson, inarticulate with hysterical grief, summons the landlady, who quickly notifies the police. Radio car 12 answers the call. Followed quickly by detectives Kilgore and Coffer to the morning flying squadron, and Dr. Klausner, in charge of the central police ambulance. Mr. Jackson stands by as Dr. Klausner makes a brief examination. Uh, how could it have happened, Doctor? Mm. You are the husband of the deceased? Yes. Just what did you say the circumstances of the death were? Well, I, I don't know just what you mean. I, I woke up and I found her lying on the floor. I tried to revive her and... He was dead. Mm-hmm. What does it look like to you, Doctor? Well, from a superficial examination, I would say heart trouble. But naturally, we'll have to make an autopsy as a matter of official routine. Yeah, of course. I'll, I'll phone the coroner. Where, where are you going to take her? It'll be necessary to remove the body to the morgue. Oh, the morgue? Oh, but can't I give her a decent burial? Of course, Mr. Jackson, but first we must make an autopsy. No, no, don't do that, please. Let me have her. Don't take her away from me now. I don't want to live without her. Don't take her from me. I don't for the love of heaven. Don't. Over the grief racked protests of Mr. Jackson, his wife's body is removed to the morgue, where the following day the coroner's surgeon, Dr. Wagner, performs an autopsy. His findings prompt him to report to Joe Taylor, chief of detectives. Dr. Yes. Wagner calling, Chief. I'll put him on. Hello, Doc. Hello, Joe. What's on your mind? You know that Jackson woman who was found dead yesterday morning? Yeah, yeah. What about her? I just completed the autopsy. Yeah? Well, there are several mighty funny circumstances. Her lungs are congested. What's that mean? She might have died of suffocation. I see. And furthermore, there's a bruise over the left eye, an abrasion over the left cheekbone, various discoloration marks about the throat, face, and shoulders. Doesn't look like natural death, eh? Well, I don't feel justified in signing the death certificate as natural death until the case is investigated. Yeah, I think you're right, Doc. I'll take care of it right away. And thanks for calling. Yes, Chief? Ask Captain Davis to send a couple of his homicide men up here. I think we've got a murder on our hands. <laughs> Captain Davis, head of the homicide detail, assigns detectives Joe Filkus and Thad Brown to investigate the strange death of Mrs. Jackson. The two officers first familiarize themselves with the preliminary reports turned in by Kilgore and Coffer, and then drop in on the apartment house on Whitmer Street where the Jacksons reside. They first talk to the landlady. Hey, now, Mrs. Walker, what do you know about the death of Mrs. Jackson? 
Well, I was just getting Mr. Walker's breakfast on the way yesterday morning when Mr. Jackson came running down and crying and shouting for me to come quick. He said something terrible had happened to Marge. I went back with him to the apartment, and, and there she was, lying on the bed like she was sleeping, only looking cold-like. Well, I just knew she was dead, so I called the police. Is Mrs. Jackson ill? Did she suffer from any complaints that you knew of? Well, she was an awfully nervous sort. She said she couldn't sleep very well. She had to give up coffee, she told me once. And didn't she and her husband get along all right? Oh, so far as I know. They always was a loving couple in front of me. They certainly never raised any racket in their apartment or I'd have known it. They're right above me, you see. We'd like to see that apartment, if we may. Well, certainly. Come with me. It's right up these stairs. Is Mr. Jackson at home, Mrs. Walker? Oh, no. I haven't seen him since they took her away yesterday. He was all broken up, poor lad. Said he was going to stay at his brother's. He couldn't stand to stay in the apartment where she had died. And the apartment hasn't been disturbed since Mrs. Jackson's body was removed? Oh, no. I'm not going in there where somebody's died until I have to. That's fine. What do you mean? Oh, nothing, except we'd like to see it just as it was when the body was discovered. Well, you will, all right. This is the door here. There you are. Look around to your heart's content. Thank you very much, Mrs. Walker. That's all right. And just pull the door to when you finish, please. Well, everything's orderly enough. Doesn't look as though a struggle took place. Well, you wouldn't have to struggle much if you got a garrote around the person's neck while she was sleeping. No, that's true enough. Better take a look around, Vlad, and see if you can find anything that might have been used to strangle her with. Okay. Well, now let me see. The bed's here, and she was supposed to have been found with her head laying on the floor and her feet still on the bed. I'll just look at this rug over carefully and see. Aha. Uh -huh. Well, Thad. Yeah? Here's something. Oh, what is it? Well, a dried blood clot on the rug and a discoloration of some sort. You see, this would be where her face rested on the floor. Yeah. Better phone for Ray Pinker. Ask him to come out here and make a chemical analysis of these two stains. Okay. There's a phone out in the kitchen. Oh, good morning. Who are you? I'm Thomas Jackson. This is my apartment. What are you doing here? Oh, yes, Mr. Jackson. I'm glad you came. We're police officers. Yes? Well, we're making an investigation of your wife's death. Well, what is there to investigate? She died of heart trouble, the doctor said. Yes, but we just have to make a thorough report, though, and I'd like to ask you some questions, if you don't mind. No, of course not. Go right ahead. Here, this is the condition of the apartment that it was in when your wife was removed? Yes. This is the first time I've been back. I just came to get some clean shirts. Well, Pinker's on his way out, Bill. Oh, fine. Thanks, Thad. Uh, this is Lieutenant Brown, Mr. Jackson. Oh, glad to know you, Mr. Jackson. Thank you. Well, I won't disturb you, gentlemen. I just want to get a couple of shirts. I think you'd better stay, Mr. Jackson. But why? We'd like your assistance in clearing up a few angles on this case. Well, of course, if I can help... Well, I believe you can. Now, you tell us just what happened the other night. Well, I... I got back from work a little before one. My wife had some sandwiches and coffee made for me. We talked for a while, and then we went to bed. Was your wife feeling all right? Not uh, sick or anything? No. Well, she said she had a slight backache, but other than that, she was in excellent spirits. And you went to bed around 1.15 or 1.30, huh? Yes, about that. Then what happened? Well, the next thing I knew, it was morning, and I stretched my hand out to her side of the bed, and she wasn't there. I woke up with a start and called to her, and, and I saw her lying on the floor. I tried to revive her, and then I called the landlady. Uh, just how did you try to revive her? By, by patting her arms and legs and by artificial respiration. Well, where did you learn to do that? Oh, I went to school, a physical education one. You're a pretty husky young man, aren't you? I don't know. I guess so. Do you box? Well, I've never been in the ring professionally, but I can take care of myself. Yeah, I bet you can. Did you ever have any trouble with your wife, Mr. Jackson? No. You were very much in love. Ever strike her? No. Well, I did slap her once. With the result of a misunderstanding. I see. Why did you ask that? Surely you don't mean you don't think now, that I... take it easy, Mr. Jackson. We're just asking questions. I know, but I love Marge more than anything else in the world. Oh, you were happy. We were talking about having a now, baby. calm down, young fellow. Nobody's denied a thing that you've said. Now, Mr. Jackson, just how was your wife lying when you discovered her? Well, her feet and legs were still in the bed, but 
Her face was on the floor towards the foot of the bed. Kind of strange that she should have gotten to that position without waking you up. Well, I'm a very heavy sleeper. Oh, look, well, here. Would you mind assuming her position as you found her, Mr. Jackson? We'd like to get a photograph of the scene of the death with an approximation of the position of the deceased when she was found. Don't you think that request is a little heartless? I'm sorry, Mr. Jackson, but we must learn all we can about this case. You can help us. All right. Here's the way she was lying. Head down on the floor. Near that blood stain? What blood stain? Oh, uh, I'm mistaken. That's just part of the pattern of the rug. So, that was the position, huh? That's right. Fine, Mr. Jackson. I just uh, hold it just a minute. All right, still. Thank you, Mr. Jackson. Well, if that's all you fellas wanted before, I'll be getting along. Uh, Mr. Jackson, I think you'd better come down to headquarters with us. Well, what for? Well, we'd like to take your statement. Well, but I've already told you all I know. Well, there's some more questions we want to ask oh, you. Oh, but see, If here, I must man. be blunt, Mr. Jackson, I'm placing you under arrest for suspicion of murder. Constant questions for hours on end fail to develop any change in Jackson's story. Finally, tired out by their long day's work, the two detectives send Jackson to his cell. Oh, well, a night in the jail will soften him up. Uh, maybe if he isn't soft already. What do you mean, Pat? Joe, there's something screwy about this case. Why? I think that kid's telling the truth. Oh, you're nuts. He's as guilty as the devil. I don't think so. I think he's on the level. I well, look here, that that dame died of suffocation and her congested lungs proved that, and she had bruises and discolorations around her throat and an abrasion on her left cheek and no other physical defects. Oh, yes, but now listen, you're a smart enough dick to figure out that a person who died of suffocation and whose throat shows bruise marks and was choked to death. Isn't that so? Yeah, sure, but at the same time... And the kid admitted that he had struck his wife, and he also admitted that he was pretty good with his fist. Well, still, I'm not convinced. I feel that there's some other explanation. Yeah, but what is it? We've given him every opportunity to tell the truth, and he just sticks to his original story. If there was a chance of him being innocent, I'd work for him. I've got nothing against him. And the way things stand now, there isn't a jury in the state of California who wouldn't convict him of first-degree murder. And that phony crying jag he put on over at the morgue when he identified the body. Yeah, Joe, I don't think that was phony. I don't believe the kid was putting on an act. They couldn't have done it that well. You're getting soft, lad. I think you'd better get a good night's sleep, too. <laughs> you can't kid me out of my conviction. Okay, I'm willing to give that boy every break I can. But I've got a sneaking suspicion that we're going to hang him for murdering his wife. The next morning, Pilkus and Brown visit Jackson in his jail and take him across the street with them to a dairy lunch for a bite of breakfast. Oh, well, Jackson, what'll you have? I can't eat. I'm not hungry. Oh, come on. you got to eat something. I haven't eaten a bite. Well, how about a cup of coffee, huh? Well, coffee, maybe. Yes, sir. Gentlemen, what will it be? Three coffee and a, and a couple of orders of poached eggs. Is that okay for you, Thad? Yep. Well, come on. Let's take our coffee over here while the eggs are coming up. This table over here, you okay? Well, Jackson, how'd you sleep last night? I didn't sleep. Thinking it all out, huh? I guess so. Well, what conclusion did you come to? Have you decided to tell us the truth? Oh, I did tell you the truth. Haven't anything to add this morning? No, there isn't anything to add. Now, look here, young fellow. You're in a tough spot. You're going before the jury on a murder charge, and you haven't a single defense. You were alone with your wife, and the next morning she was dead. Now, how can you convince a jury that you didn't? But I didn't do it. It's very simple. I have to promise to tell the truth and nothing but the truth. And the truth is, I didn't kill her. Oh, it isn't that easy, Jackson. Oh, but why should I kill her? How could I kill her? I had no weapon. I had no reason. I loved her. She was everything in the world to me. All right, kid. Calm down and drink your coffee. Oh, I can't. I don't want to live. Go ahead. Send me up for murder. I just as soon bump all that way as any other. No, no, no. That's no way to talk. We want to help you. We're trying to get the whole story out of it. Well, I've told you the whole story. Now, let's try again. Oh, I don't want to talk about it. Now, look here. You told us your wife was nervous. Did she ever go to any doctor for treatment? Well, she had backaches. I told her she ought to do something about it. I guess she did. She was taking treatment from a chiropodist. A chiropodist? A chiropractor or a chiropodist? A chiropractor. Oh. Well, when did she have her last treatment? Well, the night before she died, he called and gave her a, an adjustment. Well, what was his name? I don't know. The landlady got him for her. Does she know his name? Yes, I suppose so. Come on, Thad. You don't want those poached eggs. Well, the devil I don't. What's the matter? Come on. We've got a job to do. Walker, we understand that you procured a chiropractor for Mrs. Jackson the day before she died. 
I did. What was his name? Well, I won't tell you. Well, why not? Well, it's from Portland, Oregon, and he hasn't a license to practice in California. Well, no, I'm not interested in that. I want to talk to him about Mrs. Jackson. Uh, how can I get in touch with him? I don't know. You don't know? But you called him for Mrs. Jackson. I've forgotten his number. Oh, now, come on, Mrs. Walker, and be reasonable. I've forgotten, I tell you. Well, Joe, here's something, Edison. What's that? A package from Dr. Davis in St. Louis to Mrs. Jackson. Well, what's this, Mrs. Walker? Well, how should I know? It came from Mrs. Jackson the day after she died. Well, I think you'll take this in with us. Back at detective headquarters, Filkus and Brown find a woman waiting to see them. Are you the detectives who are handling the Jackson case? Uh, yes, we are. I'm Mrs. Jackson's sister. Yes, ma'am. I just received word of her her death yesterday, and I came right down from Oakland. I understand you're accusing Tommy of murdering her. Well, not exactly, you know. It looks as if he might have done it. I'd like to talk to him if I may, sir. Well, that might be arranged. I think we can do that for yeah, you. Yeah, but not right away. Why not? I'd like to ask you a few questions about your sister first, Mrs. Gardner. Why, of course. Uh, will you come into the office, please? Uh, right through this door. What's the gag, Dad? Uh, listen, listen. I'm trying to spring the guy. Listen closely. We may discover something. Uh, sit down there, Mrs. Gardner. Now, I'm not satisfied, ma'am, with the way this case is going. There are some things that you may be able to help us with. Naturally, I'd be glad to help all I can. Fine. Now, we understand that the deceased was of a very nervous temperament. Is that correct? Yes. My sister was always nervous. Uh, did she suffer from any illness, any disease? Well, no. Think, Mrs. Gardner, and please don't hold anything back. Your brother-in-law's life may depend on what we can discover about his wife. Hey, that's a little strong. This man. is my party, Joe. Now, Mrs. Gardner, is there anything else that you can think of regarding your sister's health? Well, I guess it doesn't make any difference now she's dead. I may as well tell you. What, Mrs. Gardner? Only three people in the world know this about Margie. My mother, my sister Agnes, and myself. Yes? My sister suffered from epilepsy. What? She used to have attacks quite often. Then five years ago, she had some pills prescribed by a doctor in St. Louis. They've done her a lot of good. She hasn't had an attack since she started taking them. But I got a letter from her a day or so before she died, telling me that she was out of pills and expected some any day. Did her husband know about this? No. Is this the sort of a box those pills came in? Why, yes. Where did you get that? It arrived the day after she died. Thad, get Jackson and meet us in Chief Taylor's office, and I'm going to ring Dr. Wagner. I'm afraid, partner, that our case has blown higher than a kite. <laughs> This is Mrs. Gardner, Chief. How do you do, ma'am? Won't you be seated? Thank you. Well, Joe, what's the trouble? Chief, this Jackson case has gone screwy on us. And I want you and Dr. Wagner to hear what we've got to say. Well, let's get started. I'm expecting Brown with Mr. Jackson any minute. Well, what's the mystery? Come on, let's have it. Well, there's no mystery except that I'm just a big boo. <laughs> well, I guess that's no mystery, Joe. Oh, here they are. Alice! Oh, Tommy. Oh, I'm so sorry. Alice, they think I did it. I don't want to live anymore. You tell them how I love Marge. Tell them, Alice. All right, now, Jackson, if you just calm down. Now, we've got some important business to discuss, some very I know, but I tell you, I didn't kill her. I, I didn't. I loved her. I know that, and I believe you. You do? Yes. Now, Chief, here's what we found. Mrs. Gardner tells us that Mrs. Jackson was a sufferer of epilepsy. What? Mr. Jackson has just heard that fact for the first time in his life just this minute. To arrest this condition, Mrs. Jackson took medicine. Do you recognize these pills, Dr. Wagner? Hmm, yes. Yes, of course. A hypnotic pill, a very strong nerve sedative. Would this pill be of any assistance to an epileptic? Yes, decidedly. It would ward off a seizure. Well, Mrs. Jackson had run out of pills and had not had one for five days. Oh, I think I see what you're driving now, at. Now, wait a minute, Doctor. That's not all. Mrs. Jackson had a severe chiropractic adjustment the night before she died. Could that have caused the bruises about her neck? It could. And the abrasion on her face could have been caused when she fell and hit the baseboard on the bed? Is that so? Yes. Chief, in view of what I've just heard, I don't see any necessity for an inquest. I'm convinced now that the deceased met her death by suffocation as a result of a severe epileptic seizure. I'll sign the certificate as natural death. Does that mean that I'm free? Yes, Mr. Jackson. I also am convinced that your wife's death was natural. You're free to go your way. Oh, I told you I was innocent. Mr. Jackson, I feel I owe you an apology. I'll admit that I was convinced that you were guilty. I'm afraid we fellows get too hard sometimes. Well, I don't blame you, Lieutenant. Gosh, how could you tell? 
You only had my word, and I realize now that isn't enough in a case like this. Oh, I don't hold anything against you. You and Lieutenant Brown treated me swell. <laughs> well, how about it? You think you could handle a square meal now? Well, I, I think I could make a good stab at it. this strange case closed. Detectives Filkus and Brown had acted in good faith and were only doing their duty as the facts they uncovered dictated their actions. Once they saw the way out for their unfortunate captive, they worked as hard to establish his innocence. Mrs. Jackson should never have allowed pride or whatever emotion motivated her from revealing to her husband that very important fact about her health. For surely had her sister not explained the family's secret, Tom Jackson would have hung for his wife's murder. There are still some motorists in our audience who have never been in a Rio Grande service station. Yet apparently you enjoy listening to Calling All Cars. Somewhere in your neighborhood is a service station selling Rio Grande gasoline. The operator of this station is not an employee of Rio Grande. He owns his own business. We'd like to have you meet this man. We like to do business with him, and we think you will, too. We prefer to have him sell you Rio Grande de gasoline rather than to compete with him by operating our own chain of stations. Knowing that he has keen com competition, com competition, we make it our business to supply him with a better value, with Rio Grande cracked gasoline, which he can sell to you at the same price as other gasolines yet give you more for your money. That this is no idle claim is proved by the rapid growth of Rio Grande. The growth of Rio Grande. The growth of Rio Grande. In the past few months, Rio Grande gasoline sales have doubled. And this increase comes from motorists like yourself, who have heard calling all cars and decided to drive into a Rio Grande service station and try a few gallons of police car performance. May we urge you on this, our anniversary night, to make your next stop for gasoline at a Rio Grande pump. Thank you. Los Angeles Police calling all cars, Henson all cars. The cancellation broadcast 53 regarding a murder. The victim in this case died from natural causes. That's all. Rose and Cruz. Calling all cars based on authentic police files.